seeing gold seems to be very popular out there. Plus, how does a mutual fund actually generate income in retirement? We're going to talk about those topics, but before we get to those, we've got to sort of hit what the headlines are. And one of the biggest headlines is that the folks in Washington, particularly the Senate, have reconvened this past week, which means that it is highly likely that we will see another coronavirus stimulus package coming out of Washington. So we thought today we would take some time and sort of break down what we see as potentially likely and what we see as potentially unlikely. I'll tell you, it's just in time for those folks to take another look at these aid packages because the extra unemployment benefit, that extra $600 per week that came in the original CARES Act is actually due to run out this week, July 31st. And in some states, particularly Florida, because of how they define a week of unemployment, it actually runs out sort of this weekend. Other states like California, New York, and Texas also sort of for, follow that same formula definition of a week. So many folks here in Florida are seeing that change happen instantaneously. So we'll get to all of that. First of all, welcome to Dollars and Cents, where we help you make sense out of all of life's decisions involving your dollars. We're Central Florida's longest running radio program coming to you live every Sunday morning on the News Radio Orlando Network and 96.9 The Game as well. We also happen to be one of the top 25 financial planning podcasts on the World Wide Web, so check us out there. We've got over 10,000 downloads of our program at last count. My name is Joel Garris. I'm a certified financial planner, certified financial fiduciary with Nelson Financial Planning, where our team of certified financial fiduciaries stands ready this very week to help you change your life with a successful financial plan that provides you with peace of mind for the future. So what's on the table in this new coronavirus bill and what's likely to come out of it and what's probably not so likely to come out of it? Well, first up is the extra amount of money that folks have been getting with their unemployment. That has been an extra $600 per week on top of the state unemployment benefit, and that is due to stop or to end as we speak. So the Democrats have suggested extending that extra $600 to the end of the year. Meanwhile, the Republicans have suggested capping that extra amount at something like 70% of what someone's prior wages were. And then this past week we heard from the White House and they said, well, what about $200 per week extra? And what's interesting about all of them is that not any of those, Democrats, Republicans, or the White House, are suggesting that they're not going to do it. I think it's really a function of how much not whether it will happen. So stay tuned for that. There will be, we suspect, an extra amount of money that continues on in your unemployment benefits. Where does it all wind up? Well, if the Democrats are at 600 and the Republicans are at 70% of wage and the White House is at 200 extra per week, we would imagine that it's probably just like any good negotiating, probably gonna end up somewhere in the middle. So figure maybe an extra 400 per week in terms of the extra amount for unemployment. I don't think they'll go to a replacement formula because that just makes it extra hard to sort of calculate that. They're running into issues with just getting people their unemployment anyway. The system is completely overwhelmed. And so I don't think they'll go to something that's gonna require an additional calculation or an additional workload on the folks that are trying to get the unemployment out but rather they'll probably go to sort of a, a, a flat number. So expect that to come in around 400 extra per week. And obviously that's something that they need to get on. I'd be surprised if we see movement on it this week because they just got back into town last week, but who knows, maybe they'll recognize the need given how many people have been affected by this COVID pandemic and the number of people, the sheer number of people that are out of work. 
Other items on the list, there's been a suggestion of a return to work bonus of $450. That was suggested by Senator Portman. That is to encourage people to return to work. The reality is that at last count, somewhere around 70%, the number that I saw published this past week was 68%, that's pretty close to 70%, that 68% of the people that are collecting that extra 600 unemployment are in fact making more on unemployment than they were when they were working. So obviously then there's sort of a disincentive to return to work and there's some thought of trying to encourage folks to come back to work by having this kind of extra bonus. I don't think there's much traction on this. The suggestion has been made, but I don't think that it's likely to see that come about. I think the notion of reducing the extra amount of the unemployment benefits sort of gets you to the same point, if you will, in terms of trying to encourage people to get back to work. Similarly, there's been a suggestion of a payroll tax cut. And understand what that is. Payroll taxes, that's 7.65% of your pay. The employer matches 100% of that. That's what goes to fund Social Security and Medicare. And as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, the state, the financial state of those two programs is not exactly in great shape. So I don't think we'll see them trying to cut the funding to programs that are already in a, a weaker state and in a weaker state because of the fact that there's less people paying in to those programs because there's less people that are employed. Remember, when you're collecting unemployment or collecting income from other sources, you don't have to pay your payroll taxes on that. Payroll taxes only apply to whether you are actually getting a paycheck. That's another reason why the, the benefit of that is that you wind up being only paying into those payroll taxes if in fact you're working. So it doesn't, it only helps people that are working. It doesn't really help people that aren't working. So I don't think we'll see that. Next on the table is something though that we, I think we will see something that goes along those lines, and that is some rental assistance. Eviction bans, meaning bans on the ability to evict tenants who weren't paying, were actually instituted under the CARES Act, but a lot of those are set to expire, yet you still have a lot of households that are really struggling in terms of being able to pay their bills. So you certainly don't want someone to have to become homeless as a result of, of all of this. So I think we'll see some amount of rental assistance, both from the renter side and also from the landlord side as well. So this one will probably make it in. It's already made it into the version, the HEROES Act that the Democrats passed out of the House, except some form of this to appear in the, uh, in the next uh, coronavirus stimulus package. Most importantly, stimulus check. When's that gonna happen? I think a stimulus check or another stimulus check is almost certain to come out of the next round of the stimulus bills that pass to help people in respect to this COVID pandemic. Remember the CARES Act, the check was $1,200 and it went to households if you were single under 75,000, married couples under 150,000. Those were kind of the thresholds for being able to send money to folks. And they graduated up to higher levels where you got less. But basically, if you were single and above 100,000 of income or married and above 200,000 of income, you wound up not getting the, the, the check in, in any way, shape or form. So direct payments like that are the fastest way to get money in people's hands. So I would mark that one as probably highly likely in terms of getting that stimulus check. So we're gonna to slide to the, a break. When we get back, we're gonna continue the conversation on what's in, what's out in the next coronavirus package. All that and more when we return here on Dollars and Cents. So let's shift some gears and talk about a, a topic that we were talking about at the beginning of the hour, and that is the magic of gold. Gold, 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 everybody these days is crazy for gold, but be careful. Just this past week, 
gold closed at a record 1900, breaking its record from August of 2011. So before you get too excited about it, understand that we want to get some facts on the table. And it's really, really popular now to be investing in gold. So let's talk about that. It's always, a, gold always attracts gains in popularity during times of uncertainty, and so a lot of dollars flow in. In that respect, gold sales are almost like annuity sales. Uncertain times, you buy something thinking that, oh, I'll get XYZ, and the reality is that XYZ never really ever pans out. Get the gold analogy there. Anyway, here's the numbers. Just how much chasing is occurring with gold these days? It's going to frighten you. One year ago today, gold ETFs, exchange traded funds, so gold funds, if you will, held a total of 118 billion of assets. Today, that number is up by nearly 100%, 215 billion of assets, over 20% of all the money that is held in gold exchange traded funds flowed in during the course of this year, 2020. A record 40 billion so far. That's eight times the amount of dollars that flowed in during the same period last year. That is the very, that is the very definition of what it means to chase return. And the reality is that if gold is just now, nine years later, approaching the peak that it hit in August of 2011, that would mean that over the nine years, the annualized return of gold would be in fact zero. That doesn't sound like much of an inflation hedge, which gets us to the second item to consider if you're getting a little bit too crazy about gold is the actual returns. It, in fact, the actual returns for gold over time are quite terrible. It's actually a pretty poor hedge against in inflation. If you, if you go back to even a longer period of time, so if you just compare current price versus where it was nine years ago, there, there's no return. If, if we're just now getting back to where we were in August of 2011, that means that, the, that over that nine-year span, that, that's a zero re return. If you go back even longer, and we often encourage folks to look at long-term trends to get an accurate view of how it makes sense to invest your money, right? I mean, it's not enough to look at the past three years or the past five, or really even the past 10, to get an accurate view of, okay, well, what's the return in this particular asset class over time. And, and so if you pull the perspective back a little bit and look at gold over a 40 year period of time, let's go back to 1980. So that's basically 40 years. Gold during that period of time has a return that is adjusted for inflation because that's of course the head. Everybody says gold this is an inflation hedge. So we got to get gold. If you adjust the return for gold for inflation over the course of the past 40 years, it's a negative number negative 0.4%. Meanwhile, if you compare that to, you know, all the other options, stocks, 7.9, bonds, 6.2, even cash over that 40 year period of time, 1.2%. So if you're thinking that gold is some magical inflation hedge, we encourage you, don't chase the returns, look at the actual numbers and make a decision from that. In fact, if you run the numbers, Gold would have to go up another 52% from its current price to even match the inflation adjusted level it hit in January of 1980. But hey, why confuse actual performance with reality? So let's talk about reality. The reality of gold. It is a asset that becomes very popular during times of fear. And there's a suggestion out there that gold is somehow going to become the universal currency, the dollar is going to disappear, and we're going to just going to go back to walking around with gold bars in our pockets. Okay. In a word, that's a ludicrous suggestion. 
understand that the world is moving to electronic payment process and away from physical currency in the first place. The COVID pandemic is certainly accelerating that. Stop and think about that. The COVID pandemic is accelerating electronic payments. E-commerce gains grows at 16% per year every year for the past 20 years, for the year end 2018, which would be pre-COVID, more than 80 million mobile phone peer-to-peer -peer payment users occurred. That was pre-COVID. How, how, how much do you think that number has increased? You probably aren't using peer-to-peer -peer because that's mostly the younger generation. The other reality on gold is the cost. The cost and logistics of gold, costs are very high to buy it and to sell it. Usually about 5% to 10% transaction costs. So if you're buying it and then selling it, you've got to make at least 15, maybe even 20% on a return before you even break even. That's the reality of it. So don't be caught up in the glitter of gold. Avoid that at all costs. Don't get caught up in it. Remember, don't chase returns. Pay attention to what the historical returns are and have a little bit of a dose of reality when you invest your money. And I think if you apply those three principles to gold, you'll come away with a very different conclusion than what many people are that are chasing that metal these days. We'll take a break and return after these messages here on Dollars and Cents, News Radio WFLA Orlando, 96.9 The Game. So how do mutual funds actually generate out income in retirement? There's been some folks that have raised the suggestion that mutual funds aren't really a very good option to generate out income in retirement. So we thought we would take a moment on the program and walk through exactly why they are the single best option to generating out retirement. Of course, those folks that raise that suggestion that mutual funds aren't particularly good for generating out retirement, they are generally pushing a solution that we don't really think works that well at all, and a solution that is a high expense, high commission, illiquid loss of investor control investment that they never quite ever really get around to talking about but we know their secret, or should I say their dirty little secret. And yes, in fact, it is the A word. And no, not that A word. It is the annuity word. All you have to do is look back on our program last week to know about our view in depth on that. But we'll save that for another program. But we want to get to the meat of that, because after all, we've been doing it for 35 years, started by my father-in-law, Jack Nelson, 35 years ago. And so for 35 years, we've been generating out income pretty successfully and pretty regularly for hundreds and hundreds of Central Floridians that are in retirement. So we'll take a moment and share with you our little secret on it. Welcome to Dollars and Cents. This is where we help you make sense out of all of life's decisions involving your dollars. We're Central Florida's longest running radio program coming to you live Sunday mornings on the News Radio Orlando network and the 96.9 The Game network as well. We're also one of the top 25 financial planning podcasts on the World Wide Web with over 10,000 downloads of our podcast program. My name is Joel Garris. I'm a certified financial planner, certified financial fiduciary with Nelson Financial Planning where our team of certified financial fiduciary stands ready this very week. We're doing phone calls, we're doing Zoom calls, video calls, uh, and we're even doing in-person conversations. We've got to create an outdoor office environment to visit with folks this very week where we can help you change your life through a successful financial plan that provides you with peace of mind for the future. So, how does a mutual fund generate out income in retirement? And so let, let's break it down and see exactly how a mutual fund works because you have to understand that in order to understand where the income comes from. So understand, first of all, what a mutual fund is. It's a basket of stocks or bonds or both. 
If you are more growth oriented, you want those baskets to be more stock oriented. If you are more income oriented, then you want those baskets to be more income oriented. So that would be funds that either are pure bond funds or funds that are balanced funds, which are combinations of both stocks and bonds inside. We're generally a big fan of using more balanced funds because they have both that stock and bond component inside of that single fund that ultimately helps to reduce the volatility of the fund itself, but also generates out income during the course of retirement. So start there with an understanding of what a mutual fund is. It, it is more than just a basket of stocks. Certainly there's everyone, when people think mutual funds, they often I think, think that oh, mutual funds are only baskets of stocks. That's not at all the case. There's mutual funds that are bond mutual funds. There's mutual funds that are balanced mutual funds. Uh, if you are growth oriented, you want more on the stock side. Uh, and if you are income oriented, you want more on the balanced or bond side of things. So once you understand what a mutual fund is and the different types of mutual funds you can and have in fact have and certainly want to have when you shift into the retirement income phase of your life, there's no less than three distinct ways that a mutual fund, particularly a balanced fund, generates out a major portion of income for a retiree to receive that income on a regular basis. So here are the, the, the distinct ways that that happens inside of a mutual fund. First and foremost of all, the dividends. Remember, okay, there's a portion in a balance fund that is stock oriented. Those stocks generally are large companies, large companies generally paying a dividend. That dividend yield, usually about 2% right now, uh, if you look at it uh, in terms of the dividend yield on the stocks. So that dividend yield, as is always the case, dividends are completely independent of performance of the market. So that's piece number one, usually about 2%. Next piece is interest. The, the bond side of a balanced fund, if you will, has uh, interest yield of usually around about one to 3% yield. Again, the interest payment on a bond is completely independent of performance because the interest payment is the coupon payment and that's what pays. Next is capital gains. So capital gains, two to three percent usually on a annual basis. What capital gains represents in a mutual fund is that if you are using actively managed funds, that means that there's some buying and selling of the underlying stocks inside of it. And so when the portfolio manager does that, he sells at a profit, guess what? That creates a capital gain that goes on the books and then is proportionally distributed to the holders of that particular fund. So what are we up to? We've got dividends, 2%. We've got interest, 1% to 3% and we've got capital gains two to 3%. Th those are the three distinct ways in which a mutual fund generates income out along the way. Now, oftentimes people don't take that income out, they reinvest it and they set up a set dollar amount to come out of the funds, but understand that the reinvestment of dividends, interest and capital gains are purchasing new shares as those happen, effectively allowing the shares in the fund to stay relatively stable. So add these numbers up, dividends at 2%, interest 1% to 3%, capital gains 2% to 3%. What do you got? You got 5 to 8%. That's pretty good numbers, right? I mean, that would more than cover my retirement income if I was spending at 4%. The interest, the dividends, and the capital gains. It's really kind of amazing how that works. Plus, we haven't even talked about one of the best parts, which is the potential for capital appreciation and how that works over time and why it's important to understand that with everybody living longer, you need that additional amount of growth on your portfolio. So there you go, mystery solved. That's how mutual funds can generate income. And more importantly, that's how you avoid a product that is high commission, high expense, limited liquidity, and com involves complete loss of investor control. With that, we'll take a break and return after 
these messages here on Dollars and Cents with Joel Garris on News Radio WFLA and 96.9 The Game. 100 million emails per day. 100 million emails per day. No, that's not the number of emails that are floating around every day. That's the number of emails attempting to scam people that Google says it blocks every day. A hundred million emails that, that, every day. That's just an incredible number. So we wanted to talk with you about some of the things that you can do to protect yourself because obviously there's a lot of criminals out there that are trying to scam you on a regular basis. Welcome to Dollars and Cents, where we help you make sense out of all of life's decisions involving your dollars. My name is Joel Garris. I'm a certified financial planner and certified financial fiduciary with Nelson Financial Planning, where our team of certified financial fiduciaries stands ready this very week to help you change your life with a successful financial plan that provides you with peace of mind for the future. Isn't that a staggering number? A hundred million emails a day that Google is blocking, blocking, not the ones that get through, but blocking that are attempting to scam people. How upsetting would it be to, to, to have someone tell you that they were reading your private information or seeing your login information or any of other things that you might not want everybody to know about and then the email goes on further to say that if you don't pay up, then the reality is that you wind up, you, you need to send them money. Otherwise, they are going to expose all of your information to the public. This, is, this type of action, this, this type of email scam is becoming more and more common. And, and it's basically, it, your classic case of movie drama driven blackmail, right? I mean, that's what it is. I have information about you. You don't really want everybody else to know it. So, but if you pay me money, I will, you know, sweep it under the table. And what's scary about it is that it's happening at more and more now, given the much higher level of social isolation that we find ourselves in. Uh, during the, the COVID pandemic. And it's a typical threat that plays out. And they always want the money, of course, the money that they want to prevent them from exposing the secrets that they've determined is the fabulous crook's currency, right? What is the crook's currency? Well, that, of course, is Bitcoin because Bitcoin isn't traceable. Don't confuse Bitcoin with a real currency. It is the crook's currency of choice. Probably a topic for another program, but we'll come back to that. What are some of the things that you can do to help protect yourself when it comes to these people that are trying to blackmail you through email? And thanks to the folks at AARP and their Fraud Watch Helpline, they've outlined five different things that you can do that we wanted to share with you today. First of all, this makes sense. Don't respond. Even, even if you just reply back, then you, you, they, they, they've, they've got you. It's, it, it's like almost like throwing, you know, they're throwing a fishing pole out with bait. Okay. And they throw it out to so many people and they're just looking for people to bite. Well, a bite is if you just reply to it. So don't even apply to it. Once you reply to it, in any capacity, then your name is gonna get circulated among the various crime rings and you're never gonna get any peace. So do not reply, do not respond when you get an, an email like that. The other point to remember is that on a regular basis, you should be doing this anyway, and that is to go through and change your passwords. Use maybe a password manager. There's all kinds of them out there that ultimately allow that password to be redone and refreshed on a regular basis to make it much harder for the criminals, for the hackers to get access to your information. And that's certainly 
uh, important from a technology point of view, sort of the third step that the folks at AARP outlined is that you've got to keep your antivirus software updated. It's not enough to just have antivirus software, but understand that th th there's, there's new crimes, there's new approaches, there's new scams to be aware of, and it's only through updating that software that you wind up being able to ultimately be aware of sort of the latest scam and avoid it. So make sure you're updating your antivirus software on your computer. And certainly when you use your computer, don't just log in to your friendly Starbucks, McDonald's, Wi-Fi. Those are unsecured networks. And you really don't want to do that. I mean, that's one of the biggest reasons why I sort of burn my data uh, on a regular basis rather than my rather than use Wi-Fi because security is such an issue. So be very careful with using those unsecured networks that are free to use, free to use, but at the end of the day, they do come with a cost. Uh, and of course, if you get one of these emails, you should simply just delete it. If you don't know the person that's sending it, you should absolutely delete it. And, and then any information that you don't want to be widely shared, don't put it in a, a widely shareable computer file. I mean, don't create a document with all of your passwords that says passwords, right? I mean, don't, don't do that. That just makes it all too easy for the crooks and the scammers and the hackers to uh, go through uh, and get access to your information. And, and, and clearly it's such a, an emotionally jarring experience to get those emails. You're not used to them, uh, you're, you feel threatened. And the, 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 the bottom line is, if you just follow these steps that the Fraud Watch helpline at AARP has outlined, then you're really going to be able to protect yourself as best you can. And again, it, it, it's, it's, if you get the emails, don't respond. Don't do any kind of response at all. Simply delete it if it's from an unknown sender. Change your passwords on a regular basis. Make sure you're updating those. Make sure you're changing those on a regular basis. And use, don't just use your address or a your birthday or a, a simple one. You've really got to try and be sophisticated and creative on the passwords that you use in order to prevent the hackers from being able to access them. And then make sure you're keeping your computer up to date. The antivirus software, things like that, have got to get up to date in terms of being able to protect yourself from the latest scams that are out there. And then don't use the unsecured Wi-Fi. I understand it's easy, I understand it's free, it gives for a faster connection, but there is risk there, particularly when it is unsecured. And then lastly, don't put any of that information on your computer. You know, a document entitled passwords is not gonna work. So some things to think about to keep yourself protected and safe. With that, we will wrap it on up and get on out of here. Thank you all for listening to the program, Dollars and Cents. Hopefully we've helped you to make some sense out of some of life's decisions this week on the program. We'll be back next week here on 96.9 The Game and News Radio Orlando Network. If we can help during the course of the week, please contact Nelson Financial Planning and where our team of certified financial fiduciary stands ready to help. Thanks for listening into the program. Money.